Do high quality parts matter in loudspeaker crossovers? That's what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Dallasala with AudioHawks. I wanna to talk to you guys about loudspeaker crossovers. Now we've written about this for many years. As you guys know, AudioHawks is 25 years old. Yes, I'm old. And we've done a lot of educational articles on loudspeakers, psychoacoustics, room acoustics, you name it. I wanna focus this one just on high quality parts in a crossover, whether or not it actually does give you better performance in a loudspeaker. Now there are people online that like to mod their speakers. I see them on various forum groups. I even know uh, Dennis Murphy has been on our forums and he's done upgrades for people on their speakers. And of course there's Danny Ritchie from GR Research and he's got quite a lucrative business, part of his business in upgrading people's crossovers. They send him their loudspeakers that they're not happy with and his goal is to improve their performance, takes them apart, analyzes it and such. So the question remains, is it worth doing something like that? Is it worth taking an existing design and doing the upgrades, what should you look for when you're buying a loudspeaker to make sure that you're actually getting quality parts inside? And I wanna first start off with just showing you some of the articles that we've done, because like I said, we've been doing this a long time. And I wrote an article back, I would guess back in um, 2011 or so, on do better parts matter in loudspeaker crossovers. Now, before we get into it, I just wanna give some very basic definitions. I'm not gonna go crazy detailed in this. If this if this is a popular topic and you guys want me to get more technical, we could certainly do a series of these videos. We could bring on uh, subject matter experts as well. I'm happy to do that. It really depends on your feedback. So make sure you give some comments down below, hit the thumb up, hit subscribe while you're watching this. So let's just start out with the very basics. You've got three different crossover parts in a three-way loudspeaker. You've got the low-pass filter that goes on the bass driver, and that filters out everything in the high frequencies, and it, frequencies, and it just allows the bass to go through those woofers. Then you've got the high-pass filter on the tweeter, and that blocks out everything at the lower frequencies for the tweeter. And then you've got usually a band-pass filter on a mid-range, and that blocks out the very lows and the very highs, and it makes that mid-range driver operate within its mid range bandwidth. And there's a purpose to this. It's not just bandwidth limiting these drivers, but there's many purposes to having a well-executed crossover. One of them being you get proper level matching between the drivers. The other is you operate those drivers within their intended bandwidth, and that prevents them from being overdriven, going into distortion, going into breakup mode. If you design a loudspeaker and it has a pretty stiff cone, and you don't control the out-of-band breakup modes with the crossover parts because you're just skimping on the crossover, you can drive that driver into a breakup mode, which can become audible, at very especially at very loud listening levels. So the crossovers help bandwidth limit, protect the drivers. They help give you a, a relatively smooth impedance profile for an amplifier. That way it's not gonna run into oscillation or just shut down because the impedance dips too low. So there's a multitude of reasons why you should have a really good crossover in your loudspeaker. It's kind of the brains of the loudspeaker. So you really wanna make sure that when you're picking a product, you pick one that's well executed. And part of that decision-making is looking at the online reviews, not just audio hawks, there's multitudes of websites and YouTube channels that do really detailed measurements. There are even some people that use a clip or near field scanner. So they give you the full CTA 2034 of the loudspeaker. So you understand how that performs. You get to see how the drivers integrate. You get to see the on axis, the off axis response, the distortion, that kind of stuff. That is what really um, gives you a good picture of how well the speaker has been executed in engineering design. But then you also want to take a look on the inside of the speaker as well. And we love pulling apart speakers and showing you the details, the innards of it, whether it's the drivers or the crossovers, or even the cabinet and the bracing and stuff like that. So I will encourage you guys to read these articles in the links below. These are very technical based articles. We wrote them a long time ago, but I think it's a good idea to cover them. I just want to show you an example of a crossover board here. You can see there's some poly caps, there's some sand cast resistors, they're on standoffs, some iron core uh, inductors, and then the speaker uh, terminals as well. 
And we even have some subject matter experts on these articles, like Dr. Floyd Toole contributed, uh, the late, great Steve Feinstein talking about crossovers. And I want to show you an example of a loudspeaker that I reviewed uh, many years back. And this one had probably the chinziest or cheesiest crossover I've ever seen in a loudspeaker. I wouldn't even call it a crossover. This was a two-way bookshelf speaker, and all it had on it was a couple of resistors and a couple of electrolytic caps. The woofer was run full range on this design. So unfortunately, it ran into its breakup mode. And you could hear this, especially when you turned it up a little bit. And the speaker itself, actually tonality sounded pretty good, but you could hear it was a little stringent when you would turn it up. And then when I examined it and I took it apart, I saw that there were electrolytic caps in series with the tweeter. And that's not a good thing. And then the fact that the woofer itself wasn't bandwidth limited, that's a problem. So this is an example of a speaker that actually had good driver components. It had a good woofer. It had a good tweeter. They, the manufacturer, unfortunately, just really skimped on the crossover design. So if you owned a speaker like this and you want to bring it into a service like a Danny Ritchie or someone else online, it might behoove you to do the upgrade on the speaker, assuming it's economically feasible. You don't want to upgrade a speaker that's worth a couple hundred bucks and the fix for it costs two or three times the retail or two or two, three times the worth of that speaker. It'd be like taking a, um, a Daewoo or a Pinto and supercharging it. You know, why would you put all that money into an engine mod on a car like that when it's not worth much and it's just not a good car to begin with? But if you had a car like a BMW, like a B58 engine, and it's fifty or sixty thousand dollar car, and you're already starting off with a good base. You're starting off with one of the best engines ever made. It might be worth spending a couple of grand getting a tune on that car, changing the downpipe, or just you know putting some performance into that car that the manufacturer left on the table. In those situations, it could make more sense that you would do an upgrade. And here's an example of a, a really well. Um, designed loudspeaker. It's a company called Bamberg Audio, and I don't think they're in business anymore, but Philip Bamberg was a really, really intelligent uh, audio engineer. He's done some great designs. And you can see he didn't really spare too many expenses on this crossover. He's got some good parts, air core inductors, big poly caps, tight tolerance parts. I mean, that's just a nice layout. So I want to go over some of the basics um, on identifying good versus not so great parts. So let's start with inductors. You've got basically two types of inductors that you could find in loudspeakers. You've got air core inductors, the picture on the left, which is this one right here. And then you've got iron core inductors, which has a ferrite in the middle. And that's this picture here. So the advantage of a ferrite or a, um, a core inductor like this, a laminate core inductor like this is, is number one, it's cost savings. These are a lot cheaper than air core. Number two, they're smaller because you have that ferrite. So you could get higher inductance for, for a smaller area. But the problem with a laminate core like this is they saturate and they can get a lot of nonlinear distortions in them. Even before they saturate, they just have higher distortion levels and that is clean sounding. And this is something that you can verify when you measure a loudspeaker if you put these kind of parts in it, especially in the critical mid-range and tweeter areas. It doesn't matter as much. It's not as critical at base frequencies. Some people could get away with doing air, uh, iron cores if those chokes get too big. Now, I know probably Danny would not want to use an iron core on any design. He'd probably want to do all air core. And, and I'm kind of the same way. I prefer air core. If it's a really high end, no holds bar, you know, no expense pay, uh, spared loudspeaker design, I expect to have big air core inductors on a good speaker design. And I expect the uh, wire gauge to be reasonably thick, like something like this. You don't want dental floss. And when you start seeing parts that have really thin gauge and the wiring on the speakers is really thin and the capacitor voltage is pretty low, you know that that speaker is not going to be able to handle a lot of power and it's going to run into thermal limits pretty quickly. So that's another gauge right there, just kind of looking at the internals of the parts. I want to talk a little bit about capacitors. You typically see two types of caps, you see poly caps or mylar caps as well, or, or you see electrolytic caps. So the poly is on the left side and then the electrolytic is on the right side. I've seen um, execution of crossovers where they use electrolytic caps in the crossover and then they sometimes put bypass caps on them be to, because it linearizes the response. The disadvantage of um, an electrolytic cap is you have something called dissipation factor and a capacity which measures the losses of signal due to leakage and equivalent series resistance or ESR. So 
electrolytic caps are at a huge disadvantage compared to poly caps. And you don't typically want to put these in series with a driver like a tweeter because you will get nonlinear behavior. You want to see poly caps in series with the tweeter when you can, like this one right here. And I want to talk to you guys also about just power capability of these crossover parts. You can open up a speaker. I remember years ago, I opened up, I think it was a Sermon Vega, and all it had was a little electrolytic cap in series with the tweeter. Again, the woofer was fully open, no, um, no crossover on the woofer. I got rid of those speakers within a year. I was in high school when I owned them. They weren't a very good speaker. They had decent bass, but they would break up, and, and the parts inside were really low quality. Other than the woofer itself, that was the best thing about those speakers. But you look at good speakers, and you'll see high-voltage rated parts, like this capacitor here, 630 volts. Or you look at the parts, and you take a look at the tolerances of them. A really good loudspeaker design is going to have tight tolerance parts. Whereas the cheaper stuff, the stuff that's more budget friend, uh, friendly is going to have higher tolerance or wider tolerance. You'll see plus or minus 10 or 15%. You really want to have in the critical circuit components, plus or minus 5%, even plus or minus 2%. And it makes a difference because you want the consistency of each speaker to be as close as you can to the reference design. In engineering, we do what's called a Monte Carlo analysis. And what I used to do back in my telecoms days when I used to design filters or analog front ends of modems and stuff like that is I would put all of the parts into my simulation program. Then I would put their tolerances and their values and I would run a Monte Carlo analysis and it would output all the variations of frequency response over a given load and it would factor in the tolerances of those parts and it would show you a range of how that amplitude response would vary based on the tolerances of the parts. And it really did matter when you use tight tolerance parts to kind of bring that closer together. And, you know, getting back to the point of when you're looking at doing upgrades to loudspeakers, we got to first make sure you're starting with a good base. Is the speaker worth upgrading? Are the drivers good on that speaker? Is there some sentimental value that you hold on that speaker that you want to go do an upgrade to it and keep letting it run for years to come? I do have a fondness for vintage speakers. I, I was a JBL fan back in college. In fact, I had these vintage um, Pro 3s. I used to use them as a little satellite speaker. I got them reconed at a company called Simply Speakers in St. Pete because I just liked them. They're a portable speaker. They, you know, what they did was pretty good for their size. So one thing that was interesting to me is when the company did the reconing of the woofers, they wanted to upgrade some of the crossover parts. And there was some pretty bad electrolytic caps in there and they were old. So I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's put some better caps in there. And they put higher quality poly caps. They also had to modify the, the design a little bit because the poly cap that replaced the electrolytic cap had lower resistance. And when you put the same value of capacitor in the same circuit and you reduce that resistance in series with the tweeter, that tweeter level is going to be louder. So you have to factor that in when you're doing crossover upgrades. If you're going to change parts for more esoteric parts and they happen to be better parts with lower resistance or lower losses, you're going to, you're going to have to factor that in when you're redesigning the crossover or you're making these kind of modifications. Okay, so let's say your speaker has really good parts in it, like really high quality inductors, really high quality capacitors, high power resistors, great drivers. Does that mean you're guaranteed to have great sound or great performance? Not all the time. I had a case where I had these high-end uh, loudspeakers, a bookshelf speaker. This was a very expensive speaker. And look at the impedance graph on this. And the only reason why I measured this impedance initially was because when I was cranking this up on my Marantz integrated amp, it would shut it down at very high level. So I went and I did an impedance measurement and I saw this huge dip at two kilohertz. And what this was, was an incompetent design. They actually had two parts in parallel in, this, in the crossover. It was creating a resonance. And you saw this in the impedance and it was shutting down the, um, the amplifier. So this is an example of what Dr. Floyd Tool, Tool would call an ecological disaster. The manufacturer used good parts, but the execution of those parts wasn't the greatest. But this could be fixed. This could be fixed by someone that's a professional that knows what they're doing. And it should have been fixed by the manufacturer. But I don't even think this company is in business anymore. Like I said, I've been collecting data for 25 years. And that's the other point I'll bring up too. I remember there was a speaker company years ago from AV123. I think it was Swan was the brand. I used to get samples in from them all the time. And 
either the crossover was wired wrong or a driver was at a phase or the integration was just so poorly executed. The crossovers, they used good parts. The drivers were really good. The cabinetry was beautiful, but the end result was the speaker wasn't great. Or I would measure one speaker and it would measure completely different than the other speaker from the same batch. So QC is a big issue with some of these companies, especially even if the loudspeaker is engineered in the United States, if it's made overseas, and they are not QCing it over there and they're not paying attention, it could very well be wired wrong. It could be assembled wrong. And then sometimes on the assembly line, if you don't give the people that are assembling very specific instructions to use these specific parts, they'll swap out for whatever parts they have available as long as it looks like it's the same value or they'll cheapen the design. They'll use cheaper parts. I've seen that happen with many companies and the, the key to having good quality control when something is manufactured in China is to have someone overseeing that production of those loudspeakers because the goal is you make the loudspeaker as close to reference design as possible. And that's when it takes a company that has good engineering know-how and someone that really does quality care to ensure that. So again, this is more than just going and upgrading a crossover with some esoteric parts. You have to start with a good base before you decide if that's something that's worth doing. So I'll give you an example of a loudspeaker that actually is not a bad speaker for what it is that could use some upgrades to it. It was back uh, 2012 or so I, I reviewed a pair of Infinity Primus 363s. This was not a bad speaker. At 758 bucks a pair, it wasn't worth it. I honestly, there was better speakers for that money, but they were on sale for $400 a pair when I got them. And in fact, during the review, Fry's was blowing them out for $200 a pair. And I just told people, go out, run out and get these because you're not going to get a better speaker on the planet for $200 a pair. Something that's near full range, you know, it has decent output, good sound quality, good tonal characteristics for $200 a pair. This thing was a steal, but it's not perfect. And because it's a budget loudspeaker, they made compromises. And part of the compromise was in the tweeter driver. They actually used a forum tweeter in an eight ohm system because they wanted to increase the sensitivity. That tweeter didn't, ha didn't have a lot of uh, magnet to it. You could see it had a little neodymium slug. So BL was really low on it. The tweeter also couldn't play very low in frequency. So they had to put most of the upper mid-range uh, duties on that excellent mid-range that they had. And the woofers themselves were really good. Just the tweeter was a little bit cheesy. They could have put a better tweeter on the speaker, but at $400 a pair, it's understandable. But the parts, the parts in the crossover weren't the greatest. There was some cheese in here. There are a lot of uh, ferrite inductors. There's one uh, air core inductor that's probably on the mid or the tweeter, so that's good, and a bunch of electrolytic caps. Not the greatest crossover in terms of parts wise, but in terms of execution, the crossover overall was really well done. There was good integration with the drivers, as you could see in my measurements that I show you right here. So this is this is a pretty darn good measuring loudspeaker, despite the fact that its budget doesn't use the best parts. But there were some inconsistencies per sample, as you could see here in the impedance plots. The impedances don't match exactly between the left and right speakers. And part of that is a, probably it's a lossy cabinet. You know, maybe they didn't put as much stuffing in one, or maybe there was a leak in the ports. The assembly on the cabinets could have been improved, but they definitely didn't track as well as I'd see on higher end speakers. Which brings me to the point when you're looking at something, when you're looking at a really high end loudspeaker, whether it's like a Perlison or a Focal, or there's just so many brands out there that make upper echelon speakers with cost no object kind of performance and parts execution. And these guys have the right tools to make an excellent speaker. They have a clipple near fill scanner or they have an anechoic chamber. So they know how to do a series of measurements to understand how the loudspeaker performs. So a case like this with the Perlison S17, now these are not cheap speakers, they're 16 grand a pair, but the crossover execution is about the best I've ever seen in a passive speaker. And I want to show you just what that looks like with these parts. And the drivers, of course, are excellent. But you can see here, this is the base driver crossover. It's got all big air core inductors, high-end poly caps, thick speaker cable, you know, twisted braided cable. So it reduces the DSR. It, re it, it reduces the, um, the coupling, mutual coupling. And then you could look at the mid-range tweeter crossover here. And this is using some really heavy-duty um, resistors. So there's a lot of heat 
capability, a lot of thermal management going on here. Tight tolerance parts, I believe these are plus or minus 5%. In fact, they have a, Perlison has a limited edition version. I think they match it to 2%. It's even tighter than that. They show me frequency response graphs between their limited edition speakers, and they, they line up right across the board to each other. So in a case like this, it would be a waste, total waste of time trying to send a speaker like this into a third party to improve the crossover because this crossover is already optimized. And I wouldn't even recommend you take an expensive speaker like this and void the warranty and ship it out to someone to try to improve it. And in some cases, they might make it worse. You never really know. That's what you have to really be careful about when you consider doing upgrades to loudspeakers. And I would tell people before you run out and, and you say you're not happy with your loudspeaker and you want to send it into someone to do an improvement on it, number one, what's the speaker worth to you? Is it worth spending that much money or is it going to only cost a couple of bucks, a couple of hundred dollars for $3,000 pair of speakers? What's the guarantee that you're going to get better performance on it? But before you even consider that, Maybe look at your room setup, look at your room acoustics, look at the positioning of your loudspeakers, look at the equipment that you're using, look at your seating position, get all of that right first. I can't tell you how many times, because I do consultations on the side where people come to me, they already have good equipment, they already have separates, they have high-end Bowers and Wilkins speakers, they have high-end Focal, they have Perlis and you name it, they have JBL synthesis and they're not happy with the sound. So they automatically think, maybe I should change the cables. Maybe I should change my speakers. Maybe I should change my DAC. And then I see that the center channel is placed on the floor or the speakers are up against the wall. Or if I have them run an acoustic measurement in their room, the RT60 decay time is up to a second. It's not controlled. The acoustic space is not controlled or they're sitting on a sidewall or they're sitting on a back wall at a maximum pressure area. Those kind of things you really need to consider before you go and send your speakers in to have them upgraded. But to answer the long response here is better parts do matter. It really does. If you want the very best performance in loudspeakers, you want to start with a good foundation. You want to have someone that knows how to execute good parts into a cabinet, uses the good parts, uses the poly caps, uses the air core inductors, uses really high thermal um, resistors, very tight tolerance parts, competently designed so each speaker is working within its bandwidth and it's not operating in the breakup mode at audible levels. That's what really matters above all else is the execution. But yes, better parts will give you better sound. But there comes a point where is it worth spending $1,000 on a cap? Mm, that's a little bit of a gray area. So I'm kind of curious what you guys think. Have you sent in your speakers to be upgraded by anybody or have you done your own? Are you a DIY kind of person? Personally, I would love to take in a pair of speakers that Danny has done a mod to versus the original and do some listening and do some measurements. I would love to see whether it's me or someone else that does third party measurements. I would love to see that. I think that would be an, a great exercise. It'd be a lot of fun. But guys, if you like this video, please hit thumb up, hit subscribe. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends.